What is inspiration? What inspires you? Who inspires you? And why do they inspire you? Some of the questions I get asked on a regular basis revolve around who I look up to as inspiration. And living in Girona as an athlete, I'm surrounded by hundreds of professionals in their given chosen path, whether that be a cyclist. But do I find my inspiration from those that look around me? Do I find inspiration from cyclists, triathletes, swimmers, doctors? Or do I find it elsewhere? Growing up, I was a keen surfer. I always looked up to surfers like Marco Palupo, Taj, Kelly Slater. Like these guys were guys that I looked up to because they excelled in the sport that I was I guess, undertaking. I was a little surfer and I wanted to be good at surfing. If I fast forward 30 odd years to where I am now as a cyclist, while I have cyclists that I do look up to, it's not a source of inspiration for me. I like to look outside of the box. I like to look at artists. I like to look at surfers still to this day, skiers, snowboarders, musicians. But strangely enough, I thought my biggest inspiration actually comes from within my own family. And I thought that as part of this week's vlog, I would chat to you about one of these people. It's actually going to be my father. So my dad, Brian Thompson, is a cyclist. He still acts like a 23 year old, albeit with a more mature man's hat on. I don't want to say a mature man's body. He is, he's 63, but he, he still lives like a, like a young guy and he rides his bike six days a week. He goes toe surfing with my brother. He's done some amazing things on the bike. And I thought this week, as part of like a mini series, what I do is I'd interview my dad and I'd have a chat to him about some of the things that he's done over the last couple of years, what he's most proud of, share a little bit about his background as a cyclist, but also as a type one diabetic, and also give some advice on, you know, what anybody looking to set a goal, what they can learn from, uh, from his experiences. So yeah, over the next couple of weeks, I'm gonna be sharing some insights from my mother, my father, and my brother around what they do to inspire me. And so this week, let's dive in. We're gonna to chat to my dad, Brian Thompson, from his bike, I don't wanna say garage, because it's more than that, his bike museum, his bike storage room here in Perth. I'm Brian Thompson. I'm 67. I'm retired, so I ride my bike. I normally spend about 17 hours a week riding my bike. Exercise is a really important part of being a diabetic. The more you exercise, the better you are. So obviously it's a matter of keeping your weight under control and putting in effort so that the blood pumps around your body. I've been a diabetic, a type one diabetic, since I was 31. So it's 36 years. I became a diabetic while in Mumbai in New Zealand and I just thought I was dying at the time and they said to me, they put me in a hospital and said you're a top one diabetic and I was relieved. As a lot of you guys know and as I spoke about before, using exercise to overcome my own mental health demons has been a really important part of my life. And I think what I find interesting is that my dad's used the exercise in his own way to overcome his diabetic demons. And I know that growing up, uh, dad always reminded us that, you know, as a diabetic, his life expectancy was less than a normal human being's life expectancy, and that he would likely suffer from health complications if he didn't keep active. To watch him use that exercise as a way of benefiting, benefiting himself, I think I've been inspired by that. And I think, you know, I've learned from that. I also now use the exercise to better my own life uh, in the form of, you know, helping to, uh, to better my own mental health. I retired at 52. I had no plans to retire at 52. I just got an offer to retire. Someone wanted to buy my business. I went, if you want it, it's yours. I then had to find something to do. I didn't want to go back to work. I had no plans to go back to work. I knew I had enough money if I was careful to be able to survive, and off I went. Growing up, I remember waking up at 6 a.m., running down to mum and dad's bedroom and jumping in the bed with them. And at this time, dad's alarm was off. He, he wasn't exercising as much as he is now back then. And that's because he was working incredibly hard and super long hours. So dad would essentially uh, get up, leave the house at 6.30 in the morning, and he would work uh, all day until uh, 6.30 in the evening. He'd normally get home around 7 p.m. 
And, you know, we just grew up with this dad that had this incredible work ethic. And, you know, I take that work ethic that he brought to us. And, you know, I like to think that I apply it, you know, as much as he did to his, his job. Um, you know, if I, could, if I could apply that same ethic to, to what I do, then I can only hope that I'll be as successful as he is, you know, when I get his age. I realised that I didn't want to go back to work. A lot of my friends have retired or slowed down work and still go to work. And they don't need to go to work. They actually have the money to be able to not work. But they just enjoy going to work. I actually really enjoy not going to work. I don't ever get bored. I set myself some things to do. And I achieved them. And it took me about five or six years to achieve what I was trying to achieve. <laughs> around the world when I rode from St. Petersburg to Venice and then the very next ride I did I rode across the Pyrenees and I rode to Nice and if I lined up St. Petersburg and Venice and then I rode a bit across the Pyrenees I realised that that was going left to right quite a big chunk of Europe and I then thought no I've done that I think I can ride around the world. So I deliberately didn't want to just go. Boys were at school still or at university and I think I needed to be there for them. And I said to Jeanette, my wife, I'm off. And I literally signed on to ride the Tour de Afrique Silk Route, flew up to Shanghai and off we went. Well, once I had decided that I thought I could ride around the world, I didn't necessarily want to just jump on my bike and ride and not the stop for a year. I wanted that to make a bit of a project of it. And then I rode across America, and then I came back to Australia and did Australia. I did the length of Japan, the length of Bhutan, the length of New Zealand. So all of those bits added together gave me well and truly more than just riding around the world, but it gave me a feeling that I'd actually see whole countries of the way. And so each year, Dad would basically, you know, could tell us a couple of months in advance He'd have the bags packed, ready to go months in advance because similar to me, he loves to plan, he loves to get things organized. He doesn't like to get to the last minute and then have to rush to do something. So, you know, this preparation and the planning was a really important task as part of any trip that he went on. And before we knew it, he was up. And at times he'd be gone for two or three weeks. At other times he'd be gone for six weeks. And at times, I think the longest he ever went on a trip for was three months when he did the Silk Route from China to Istanbul. And, you know, while we're on that topic, I remember I was in the US with my brother at the time and we got a call from mum to say that dad was stuck in a war zone. And basically what had happened, my dad had arrived in Tajikistan, world places, and a civil war had broken out the night that they'd arrived. So you imagine you've got this bunch of cyclists in a town, a war zone's just broken out, all foreign. They were locked down uh, basically in the basement of the hotel. He recalls the story of, you know, young children riding parts with, you know, ammunition in their pockets. You could hear the ammunition um, rumbling around in their pockets. And if it wasn't for the fact that they actually called a ceasefire because they realized that there were actually foreigners stuck under the, the hotel, basically in lockdown then who knows what would have happened. But, you know, he had these incredible stories and these incredible adventures. And I think, you know, seeing him go and do that, it's definitely shaped the way that my own cycling career has progressed. And, you know, I don't race, I don't compete. And, you know, I'm interested in bettering myself. And by going on these adventures and learning and, you know, just by immersing myself in these situations, I just, I feel like I'm living and I feel like my dad did the same. And because of that, he's had these experiences that he can share with us and we can bond over that's just, yeah, you can see it in my body language, like I'm excited talking about it. I believe that life is for living. It's not a matter of being at somebody's office or someone's beck and call. You only get so many years on this planet, make the most of every single minute you've got. So I was in Greece and I just finished the transcontinental race, my first for ultra cycling. 
And I remember I was due back at work a couple of days after you know, our flight home. And my dad said to me, you know, are you excited to go back to work? And I said, no, I'm, like, I'm not. Like, this has been the best thing I've ever done. It's the first time I've actually felt alive. And he said to me, well, then why are you going back to work? And I said, well, yeah, it's my job. Like, I study construction management and economics. I had a job as a project manager. I was getting paid good income, but I didn't enjoy it. And so he, he asked me, like, why are you actually doing it? And I said, I, I guess I just, I need the money. And that's what you know, people do. They go to work. And he said, you know what? Like, life is for living. And that's one of the reasons I retired early. I could have kept working and I could have kept making money, but I decided that life was more important. I wanted to be there for you guys. I wanted to be there for your mum. I wanted to actually be able to do things with you. And it struck me that, you know, I, I asked myself that question, like, why the hell am I going to work, sitting in front of the computer, earning good money, but hating every second of it and dreaming about doing the things that I actually enjoyed doing. So I made the change. I got back to work. And I basically, you know, took my dad's advice and said, look guys, look, I can't do this anymore. I'm not passionate about this. I need to make change. And so I'm going to leave work and I'm going to pursue the cycling full time. And had I not had the dad there to push me to do that, I don't think I would have done it. So, you know, big kudos to him for actually having the confidence to tell me to do that. And uh, I'm just so thankful that I did. My proudest moment on the bike was completing my round the world bike ride. I finished in Adelaide four and a half years after I started with my son Jack and we rode into Adelaide together, had been ridden across the Nullarbor and I had tears in my eyes, it was so exciting to have completed it. My friends had been taking the mickey out of me because I hadn't finished a bit across the Nullarbor. Once I had done that, I was so excited. During this interview with Dad, I found it amazing because we actually share so many things in common that perhaps I hadn't fully realized. And listening to him talk about, you know, that proudest moment, you know, that, you know, he, he accomplished his goal, like a four and a half year goal. It's not a, it's not the type of goal that you set one day and you achieve two weeks later or a year later, like four and a half years is a long time. And, you know, I look upon myself and I've set goals and I've never done anything that length, that length of time, but, you know, I've set lengthy goals, this last year, a 12 month goal, and it's about, ticking off those small goals along the way. I think my dad did that with each of his little trips. And for that reason, I know we're definitely cut from the same cloth. We set a goal and, you know, nothing can get in the way of us achieving it. You know, whether it's a, it's a hurricane, whether it's a war, whether it's sickness, whether it's an injury. Once we set that goal, there is nothing getting in the way of us achieving that. So we arrived in Adelaide. I'd ridden the entire way around the world and I rode down this main street of Adelaide, just about to turn left to go down to the bike shop where we were going to meet up with some of my friends who had come over to see me finish and a car knocked me off my bike. Couldn't believe it. Only crashed the whole circuit. Riding in the remote places has two things that I love. First of all, it's the people. Every country you go to, people would love to come and chat with you if you're on a bike and you get to chat with them. It's amazing how, even if you don't speak the same language, there's a lot of back slapping and smiles and grins and you eat food with them and that sort of stuff. The actual world is actually very similar. It doesn't matter where you're riding, it's exactly the same. But the people in every country are wildly different. When you rode around the world, I know when you finished it, we both went to Melbourne and we got some tattoos done. What was the, um, the tattoo that you got and what does it mean? So, the tattoo I've got is the world with a bike on the top of it. And it means something to me. It probably doesn't mean as much to anybody else when they look at it, they don't know what it is, but I just smile every time I see it. So what I think's funny is that when my dad finished his round the world goal, he said to me, look mate, I need to get a tattoo to commemorate this. And as a constant reminder that, you know, I've achieved what I wanted to achieve. And so we went to a tattoo shop. At the time I was actually getting my back tattooed much to my mum's disgust, but uh, yeah, it, it, it was great. And it, and it now gives me the excuse to tell my mum, yeah, my dad's the one that's influencing, my dad's the bad influence, you know, it's, it's not my problem that I like tattoos, it's actually my dad that scores this, so you can blame him, not me. Once I had set my mind on riding around the world, it became a challenge to me. It was no way in the world I wasn't going to do it. And I had weird things happen along the way, but I managed to do it non-stop. The thing that makes me most proud is that once I set my mind to it, I just doggedly went for it. 
I used to wrap things up. I asked my dad, like, what advice would he give someone that's keen to basically realize their own dreams? And listening to his response, you know, it was, it was something he told us growing up. It's something that still lives with me. It's like, if it's a dream, just do it. You're a long time dead. You're a long time dead. So, you know, enjoy the fact that you're actually alive. Enjoy the fact that you're healthy. Enjoy the fact that you have the ability to do the things that you want to do today and go and do them because one day it'll all be over and you won't have that opportunity anymore. And, you know, it sends shivers down my spine because it's something that he's always told us as kids. But to hear him say that again was, yeah, it was magical. I think this is something that we can all learn from. And I think that's special. So as you guys have probably seen, my dad has done some amazing things. He's got an amazing mindset. And while his path in life has been different to mine, we share so many of the same values. We share so many of the same beliefs. We love the same things. And sure, we are family. But I think the way that my mum and dad raised me and the values that they raised me with, we have a very tight relationship. And, you know, his mindset around setting a goal, going about achieving it, doing something that, you know, pushes your own limit. Like, I love that. And listening to him talk about these things, you know, I knew all of these things already, but listening to him, you know, look at me in the eye and tell me these things face to face really sent shivers down my spine. And so, you know, I hope you guys have enjoyed this vlog. I hope it's provided some insight around, you know, my background, where I come from. I think over the next couple of weeks, you'll get to know my family even better, my mom and my brother, and, you know, some of the amazing things that they've done. But as a first off, I wanted to introduce you to my dad. And yeah, I, I hope it's inspired you guys to look for inspiration around you, be that from a family member, be that from a work colleague or be that from, you know, a close friend. I think inspiration exists all around us and it's about looking at people who are doing different things and looking at the good in what they're doing to help better ourselves as human beings. So that is all from me. Next week, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to be back in Girona and I hope to show you guys what it's like to be back there, not to be riding, be actually living like a bit of a tourist like a normal person again not riding my bike and then we'll return to visit my mum and my brother in the subsequent weeks hope you guys have enjoyed like and subscribe as per usual we've got lots of great content coming this year i'm going to share with you guys my plans for this year hope to meet you guys in person on the bike somewhere soon someday soon enjoy guys have a great week